I'm, I'm Sherman Lowe. Uh, most of you probably hopefully know who I am. I'm a senior researcher at the GPS lab. One of the things that we like to do at our symposium here is to uh, bring you a flavor of the really exciting research that's being done by local researchers. So uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Sigrid Close, who is an associate professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford University, uh, where she heads the Space Environment and Satellite Systems Laboratory. She has an impressive biography, and I'm going to just give you the highlights. Uh, prior to joining Stanford, she was a project leader at Los Alamos National Laboratory and a technical staff member at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where she led a program to characterize meteoroids and meteoroid plasma using high-power radars. Her honors and awards include the uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the NSF Career Award, the DOE Career Award, the Hellman Scholar, which is featured in the cover of IEEE Spectrum, and the Joe D. Marshall Award. She's a panel member of the National Research Council's Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board and Space Studies Board, and she's also co-hosted the TV program Known Universe in 2011, which aired on National Geographic Channel, as well as been a, a, a a guest expert on PBS and the Weather Channel. So maybe she stood up in front of those green screens as well. <laughs> um, so please, let's welcome uh, Professor Sigrid Close to uh, our symposium. Thank you so much, Sharon. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And as Sherman mentioned, this topic is a little bit different than what we've been hearing about. Um, but what we're going to talk about is basically still a mystery, something that's not well understood. It's also quite controversial, so I'm really eager to get your feedback on this. So the basic mystery is how can a particle no bigger than the size of a grain of sand cause an anomaly or even some type of catastrophic failure on a spacecraft? So we know that spacecraft live in this complicated environment, and it varies both spatially, it varies temporally. We often think of it as beginning at the lower boundary of the ionosphere, so let's say 50 kilometers or so, and extends outward. We know it contains things like energetic particles. Um, it contains things like electromagnetic and ionizing radiation. Um, but it also contains solid particles, things like asteroids and meteoroids and dust. We know that this environment can affect spacecraft systems. There's a lot of cutting edge research that's being done right now in trying to understand that. Uh, but again, the question is, how do these solid particles, again, things like about the size of a grain of sand, how can they potentially cause some type of an electrical anomaly? And so before I go any further, again, just because this is a I'll just give you kind of some of the definitions and what do I mean when I'm talking about these solid particles? And so there's two different types, which we are going to group into this category called hypervelocity particles. And the first are the naturally occurring meteoroids, and the second are space debris, which is basically all the junk that humans have put into space. So what is a meteoroid? Well, basically these are these small particles that travel quite fast between about 11 and 72.8 kilometers per second. Um, that upper limit is the sum of the Earth's orbital velocity about the sun and the solar escape velocity. But on average, they're going very, very fast, 30 to 60 kilometers per second. Uh, densities vary widely, so they can either be icy, so a gram per cubic centimeter or less, or they can be um, quite high up into the 3, 4 gram per cubic centimeter range, which is associated with asteroids. Okay. Should I try the other microphone? Okay. Is this better? Okay. Apologies. Yeah. Okay, and then the size regime really just depends on which research area you're focusing on. So anything less than about 62 microns is called dust. Anything between about 62 microns and about a meter or so is a meteoroid, and anything larger is an asteroid. And then, as I mentioned, there's all the junk, the space debris that we've put up there. Primarily, you have to worry about space debris in low Earth orbit, maybe up to about 2,000 kilometers or so. Um, but the speeds are quite a bit less. So even though space debris tends to be a little bit bigger, they go, on average, almost an order of magnitude slower than meteoroids. Um, densities tend to be greater than 2 grams per cubic centimeter. And there's a big size regime. When we talk about space debris, you can be talking about something about the size of a rocket body. But for our purposes, again, we're talking about the really small particles, which tend to be far more numerous. 
So the two questions we want to ask ourselves is when we're dealing with any type of space assets or space situational awareness, what's the probability that we're going to get impacted by one of these hypervelocity particles? And if we are impacted, what are the potential effects from impact? Um, so there's two main sources for meteoroids. One is asteroids, one is comets, if we're talking, again, about particles that originate within the solar system. And you may have been uh, aware that there was an asteroid or a superbolide that entered into um, our atmosphere just a few years ago. And basically what happened is that this superbolide was detected by a bunch of different cameras on board these cars over Siberia. And so um, what happened was is that they were able to triangulate the position <coughs> excuse me, of the superbolide and found out that it was going about 19 kilometers per second and it had a diameter of about 20 meters. And so these are really big particles, but the question is then how many of the really small part particles also come in? So as I mentioned, meteoroids are primarily associated with asteroids and comets. When it comes to space debris, there's been two main events that have really contributed to the majority of the space debris out there. Um, the first was a Chinese ASAT test, which was back in 2007. And this uh, basically formed almost 3,500 pieces of debris that we're still tracking today. The second is the movie you're seeing here is the Iridium Cosmos collision, which happened in 2009. And this occurred at an altitude of about 789 kilometers. It was above Siberia, and it produced over 2,000 pieces of space debris at the time. Um, I believe there's almost 400 pieces that are still being tracked today. So as I mentioned just a couple slides ago, low, low Earth orbit is really the area where we're primarily concerned with impacts with spacecraft from pieces of space debris. So the question is, how often are we going to get impacted by these particles, either the naturally occurring meteoroids or the space debris? And so we need modeling and we need data. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to get really accurate data sources. And depending on how you're actually um, illuminating these pieces of debris, you can get a different estimate, not only in how many particles are there, but actually what the size regime is. Um, but what we've done, and by we I mean NASA, um, European Space Agency, um, as well as Space Command, is we've been able to plot an estimate of the flux as a function of the particle mass. And the flux is in per square meter per day. And that blue curve is the Grun curve, which is basically just an estimate of how many meteoroids are there. And then the other different colors are an estimate of the pieces of space debris at different altitudes, ranging from about 325 up to 625 kilometers. And what you see basically is that you have this power law fall off. As you're at higher masses, the space debris tends to dominate. As you're at lower masses, potentially the meteoroids tend to dominate. Um, but what I want to bring your attention to is the fact that in the past, historically, we've only been worried about particles about 10 to the minus 3 grams and bigger. Um, this is called the NASA threat threshold. And the reason why is because they've only been concerned about the mechanical damage. What happens when one of these particles can actually puncture a spacecraft and, again, cause some kind of mechanical damage? But since there's far more of these smaller particles, the question we asked ourselves starting just a few years ago, actually when I was first at Los Alamos, was what happens when you're impacted by these really tiny particles? Even though they don't penetrate the spacecraft, can they potentially cause electrical damage through ionization and plasma formation? And so just to kind of bring your eye to this point here, one nanogram sized particle is going to impact a square meter spacecraft once per day. So the probability of being impacted by these small particles is obviously a lot greater than the larger particles, which is previously what we've been worried about. And so the next question is, has this actually happened? Have these tiny particles impacted spacecraft and potentially caused electrical anomalies and failures? And the answer to that is a guarded yes. Um, there's been some, I would say, um, suggestions in the literature that this has happened. And probably the most famous example is Olympus 1993. It was an ESA communication satellite that failed during the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, which occurs every August. And so what happened is that they lost gyro stability, and then they basically expended all their fuel trying to recover the satellite, and it ended up being a complete loss. Same thing happened here during uh, the Perseid shower in 2009. The Landsat 5 satellite also lost gyro stability. Um, they were able to recover. A point to note is that the Perseid meteor shower tends to be a very fast meteor shower that goes about 60 kilometers per second. I'll get back to that velocity point in a few charts. Um, ADOS, let me skip Jason for a second. ADOS 2 and ALOS also experienced complete power failures. Um, ADOS 2 during the 2003 Orionids, ALOS during the 2011 Lyrids. Um, a point to note is that all four of these spacecraft, none of them actually experienced any type of momentum transfer. 
So even though they failed or had some type of electrical anomaly during a meteor shower when we know there's heightened activity, there is no evidence of any impact, just the resulting or potentially resulting power issues. Um, that's a bit different than what happened with Jason 1. Um, Jason 1 um, actually had a power anomaly back in 2002. It resides in a 1300 kilometer orbit. It did experience a known impact. Its semi major axis changed by about 30 centimeters. Immediately after that happened, it had five hours of power anomalies. So, again, no momentum transfer for these four. There was a change in the semi major axis for Jason, and all five of them experienced power anomalies. So whatever hit them, other than maybe Jason, was very, very small. Um, you can also do some other investigative research by looking at the NGDC database. This is just an, a no anomaly database for US satellites and MEO and GEO. And what you'll see here is a categorization of what they believe happened to these satellites. Um, it's about 5,000 satellite anomalies over a 20-year period. And what you can see is that maybe 500 or so they believe were caused by deep dielectric charging where a particle gets into almost the center of your spacecraft. Um, about 1,000 or so are attributed to electrostatic discharge. Spacecraft build up this potential and then they get discharged. But I want to bring your attention to this Whoa. bottom row, which is basically that most or the majority of the anomalies that occur on orbit are still tagged as unknown. And what this means is that they're not sure what the primary cause was for the resulting anomaly. And so um, you may have seen my student Andrew's presentation a couple days ago, but what we've been doing in my lab since I came to Stanford was not so much focusing on the possibility of mechanical damage, which I'll say is well known. It's still um, an active area of research, but th these are tar targeted with the particles that are quite big and therefore quite rare. What we're really focusing on is this unknown electrical damage mechanism. As I mentioned, it's still controversial. Um, these are associated with the smaller particles, and because of that, they're far more numerous, and you're far more likely to get impacted by those types of particles. And the two things we're looking at is, how do these small particles discharge the satellite? Um, other people will say, well, maybe this is just due to an incoming proton or even an electron. We're saying what happens when a piece of space debris or a meteorite discharges your satellite. But more nefarious, um, you heard that I spent quite a few years at Los Alamos National Lab, where I was looking at um, electromagnetic pulses generated by nuclear bursts. So the idea is to take that same concept, the same plasma physics, and actually apply it on a micro scale. Can these small particles actually cause electromagnetic pulses that can then take out your satellite? Um, and so, just in the interest of time, I'll skip over most of this language, but the NRC uh, basically had a panel that they convened to look at this effect, what are the effects of meteorites and debris on, on spacecraft. And one of their findings is that, yes, indeed, we do have to look at the effects of plasma during impacts, including impacts of the very small but very high velocity particles, again, because you're much more likely to be impacted by them. And so what we've been doing, and I'll show you just kind of snippets of the research that we've been doing in my lab over the past few years, is taking a two-pronged approach. So one is to look at what happens when these particles actually enter into Earth's atmosphere. Well, they ablate, they form plasma, and then you can detect that plasma with high-power large aperture radars. So using these high-power large aperture radars, you can get an estimate of how many particles are there, what the masses are, and how fast they're going. Simultaneously, what you can do is you can go into the laboratory and actually take known size particles with known velocities, shoot them using some type of accelerator or light gas gun into a target, which is supposed to represent spacecraft material, and then characterize the effects. So here we're characterizing the particles, here we're characterizing the effects, and in particular, I'm really interested in looking for any radio frequency emission associated with that electromagnetic pulse. You add in the spacecraft specifications, and through this whole project, you should be able to determine if there is any electrical damage that could be caused by these particles. OK, so now I'd like to do is just, again, give you two uh, quick samples of what we've been doing. The first is, again, looking at some of this high-power large aperture radar data and impacts in the atmosphere. And then I'll talk to you about some of our ground-based experiments, actually shooting particles at targets, and then a quick conclusion. OK, so the basic idea is that when you have a particle coming into the atmosphere, it heats up, it ablates off particles. Excuse the kind of simplistic simulation here, cartoon. And what happens is, is it forms this plasma. So it ionizes the ablated particles, ionize the background neutrals. The particle itself, the meteorite itself, ionizes the background neutrals and creates this ions and electrons, which we all know is the shooting star. This is visually what you can see. And this occurs between about 70 and 140 kilometers in altitude. Any higher, and you don't really 
have enough neutral density to ionize any lower and the particles usually burned up by then. And so what we've been able to do and where I've sent my students is basically to these high power large aperture radar facilities around the world. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Altair in a second. We've also gone to Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, um, MIT Haystack in the Boston area, as well as ISCAT in Sweden. And if you're sitting at one of those radars, what you could see is basically this type of signal here. So what this is, is just a real-time snapshot from when I was at um, stationed actually at Kwajalein many years ago. And this oscillatory signal here is the actual shooting star. So this is a detection at VHF, and then this is a detection at UHF. And immediately what you notice, this is simultaneous, is that it's a lot stronger at the lower frequencies, which is consistent with scattering from a plasma. Okay, so prior to going to Los Alamos, I was at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I had the opportunity to spend a couple years at the Kwajalein Atoll. Um, I was a space surveillance analyst when I was working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and my main job was to actually track satellites to make sure we knew where all these satellites were. My side job, which ended up being my PhD and now my research group at Stanford, was to use this wonderful radar, this instrument, to actually detect the plasma. So Altair is a dual frequency VHF UHF radar. Um, it's a high power large aperture radar. It's a 46 meter diameter dish. Um, it peak power at six megawatts at VHF, six and a half megawatts at UHF. Um, circularly polarized radar with monopulse capability. So previous to this research, a lot of people were using radars that didn't have an interferometric or a monopulse capability. So they couldn't get the true 3D velocity of the particles. They also um, weren't quite as powerful as Altair. And what I did was use a linear frequency modulated chirp pulse to basically stare at a position in the sky and let these meteors come through. Um, using that LFM chirp, I was able to get a range resolution at VHF about 30 meters and 7 meters at UHF and an interpulse period of about 0.003 seconds. So we were able to get really high resolution data, which really was the first of its kind. And again, I'm dating myself, this is about 10 years ago. Um, this is an example, what we call RTI, or range time intensity image coming from Altair. So altitude or range on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. You can color code it for either power or signal to noise, noise ratio. And there's two different types of signal we're looking for. There's this sloped line, which we call the head echo. This is the plasma immediately around the meteoroid or space debris. And then there's this really strong signal that extends out to the right, which is the trail. So this is the shooting star. This is something that we're incapable of seeing. Okay, Both have its own unique contribution to the field. This is important because even though we're detecting plasma, it's going at the speed of the meteoroid. And again, we're looking at spacecraft safety, so it's all about getting to the fundamental parameters in the meteoroid. Um, the trails are wonderfully interesting if you're interested in plasma turbulence, and some of my students are working on this. Not so relevant for understanding meteoroid particles because this is moving at the velocity of the turbulence within the trail or the neutral winds. Again, this is moving at the speed of the meteoroid. So um, what we did and what I published about a decade ago was try to develop a model that takes that plasma and backs out the peak plasma density and then correlates that to a meteoroid or piece of space debris mass. Um, so what I have here is just the result of a full wave scattering model. Um, and what we basically assume is that this meteoroid's at the center of a plasma with a density that falls off, basically as 1 over r, 1 over r squared, depending what the input is. And what you can do is basically use your Bessel functions and Hankel functions to approximate the radar wave and develop um, a reflection coefficient, which again allows you to connect the measurable, which is the signal to noise ratio or radar cross section, to this reflection coefficient, which then allows you to determine plasma density. So this is the model. This is peak plasma fre frequency as a function of the size of the plasma, color-coded for radar cross-section, or it could be signal-to-noise ratio. And so this is what we actually measure. This was on the previous slide. The radius is immediately um, tied to the altitude of formation. We're going to assume it goes by a mean-free path. So this is an observable, this is an observable, and then you can use this lookup table to determine what your peak plasma frequency is. From that, you can then input this into an equation that allows you to determine meteoroid mass. So I'll go through this a little bit quickly, but the basic idea is that you have now a way to go from radar cross-section to plasma density. We can make assumptions about the mean molecular mass, we determine what the velocity is through measurables, and we can estimate then the mass of the particle. At the same time, we can use the ballistic par parameter, which is just the conservation of momentum between the meteoroid and the neutral density, and get an estimate of the mass over the cross-section. 
And then we can assume that that particle is spherical, which is a good assumption for meteoroids, not so good for space debris. And through this, we have three equations with three unknowns, the mass, radius, and density of the particle. And for the first time, we we're able to tell you, even though we're measuring plasma, we can actually give you an estimate of the parameters of the particle that form that plasma, which is what we're, again, ultimately after. And so here's some example data from Altair. Um, I'll focus just on the mass and radius. This is mass as a function of altitude and radius as a function of altitude. And as you can see, we can track now the meteoroid mass, which starts a little bit higher than about 10 to the minus 5 grams. As it's heating up, ablating off particles, it's obviously losing mass as it comes down in altitude. Same with the radius. And we can then determine what the bulk density is. And for this one, it was a little bit more dense than water, about 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And then what we can do is we can feed these parameters into threat assessment models to determine exactly how much of a threat are these, is this particular suite of particles that we detected. OK, so that was our remote research, again, detecting plasma to determine exactly what's up there. And now what I'd like to talk to you about is just a little bit about a lot of the research that I've been doing since coming to Stanford, which is an understanding what actually happens when these particles impact our spacecraft. And so the basic idea here is that you have some particle that's traveling quite fast, impacts the spacecraft, and again, this is going to be very simple, forms plasma. And that plasma is the electrons, ions, and neutrals which are expanding out at the isothermal sound speed. And what happens is that the electrons, because they have less mass and therefore a higher thermal speed, will expand out first and then get pulled back because of an ambipolar electric field while the whole plasma is expanding. Um, this isn't a new idea. Again, I borrowed this idea from the nuclear community. This is very similar to what we look at when we're looking at electromagnetic pulse generation. And what you can do is you can estimate how much charge is actually being produced from this impact. The charge scales as the mass and use um, some experimental um, observations um, that were conducted in the late 90s and early 2000s to estimate the velocity dependence. And what they found is that while the charge scales basically as mass to the first power, the velocity exponent varies anywhere between about two and four. And so again, reminding you that those meteorites go quite a bit faster than debris, what we found is that the meteorites tend to be a higher threat in terms of producing plasma and how much charge they can actually be generated. And so um, what you can do then is you can forward model that charge equation and be basically come up with an estimate of how much power could potentially be generated when you have an impact. So what I've done is use a very simple F equals MA equals QE equation, um, estimate the distance between the electrons and ions, and turn that into an acceleration, and then use the Larmor for formula, which basically says that that accelerated particle is going to radiate to get an estimate of how much power could potentially find its way into the spacecraft. So this is radiated power as a function of frequency. And um, the main takeaway of this, this is for three different types of parameters incoming particles, is that you're going to find this slowly oscillating uh, parameter, which again has to do with the electrons and ions. But you also have this kind of bulk motion due to the whole plasma expanding out into the vacuum. And if we form this into a spectrogram, this looks very similar to total electron content plots, where you have frequency as a function of time, and you see this type of chirp, where basically the lower frequencies are going to arrive later. And the power spectral density is dependent upon the parameters of the incoming particle. So for the first time, we were able to say, yes, these particles, quite small, again, nanogram size, could potentially be radiating in the frequency spectrum over a very broad frequency spectrum, I should say, that could potentially find its way into the spacecraft. And so I published this in 2010, and I have to admit there's quite a bit of pushback in the concept of an anagram sized particle taking out a billion dollar satellite. So there was a um, strong effort to try to actually understand what we're doing by going into the laboratory. And what we did is we executed a number of ground-based experiments um, using, again, these particles as our test particles and different types of spacecraft material. The advantage is that it's controlled and you know what you're impacting. The disadvantage is that, unfortunately, there's no technology available today that can fully reproduce what's going on in space. And so the two that we've used are light gas guns, which can shoot milligram, but only about five, six kilometers per second, which is far slower than meteoroids. Or we can use electrostatic accelerators. We can get up to the right speeds, but look, we're all the way down here at 10 to the minus 15 grams. So 10 orders of magnitude smaller than what you'd expect to find on orbit. 
Um, but we've executed these experiments over the past six years. We've been at the Max Planck Institute. We've been in Colorado. We've done a number of experiments at the vertical gun range. And I wanted to just give you a feel for the types of particles. This is mass as a function of speed associated with the Van de Graaffs. And as you can see here, again, we get up to the meteoroid speeds, but they're quite small particles. Um, here's just a few shots from the NASA vertical gun range. We're up in the milligram range, but again, we're only at six kilometers per second. And so the basic idea here is that you have a particle that comes in from the right, impacts the um, target, it expands in plasma, and then what we can do is we can populate this vacuum chamber with a number of different types of sensors, optical sensors, plasma sensors, and most importantly, RF sensors. And also importantly is we can get down to vacuum conditions, which is what we'd experience on space, so about 10 to the minus 6 torr. Um, we've developed a number of sensors, as I mentioned. Uh, we've developed in-house plasma sensors, optical sensors. We've used patch antennas ranging from 165 all the way up to 916 megahertz. We've had spectral photomultiplier tubes. So there's quite a bit of data here, which I will fully admit we're still trying to fully understand. Um, but what I'd like to do is just to give you a sampling of the RF data, especially for this community, to show you how does this compare to the model. Um, the types of targets that we used were primarily spacecraft related, so we had optical solar reflectors. We also had active E-field sensors, as well as tungsten and aluminum. A lot of these were donated by Lockheed. Um, and we were able to bias these sensors to, again, represent spacecraft conditions. So as I mentioned earlier, spacecraft are biased um, due to residing in a plasma, and we wanted to fully reproduce that by biasing both positively and negatively. Um, just again, in the interest of time, let me skip to some of the results. Okay, so here's an example, again, quite a bit of data to get through. This was published a few years ago um, in plasma physics. And so we have the optical, so this is one impact going about 40 kilometers per second. It was a femtogram sized particle. We have an optical signature associated with the impact. We have a plasma signature, so this is the net current um, that we're capturing with our retarding potential analyzers. But most importantly is we're seeing quite a bit of RF as well. And when we first started this, I had assumed we'd need to do quite a bit of signal processing to see any signal. And again, Andrew mentioned this a couple days ago, but for many of the signals that we detected, it was actually just vis visible on the scope. So this is the E-field um, target. This is the 916 patch, and here's the 315 patch. You can see that there's quite a bit of noise. And we had three of each, and again, the RF signal was readily seen right on this oscilloscope. And so the question came, well, how often are we going to be detecting this RF, and what type of peak power should we expect? So again, remembering that even though we're at 40 kilometers per second, these are femtogram-sized particles. So what I did is I plotted mass as a function of impact speed. And again, this slope is just due to the fact that we're at a Van de Graaff accelerator. So there's this dependence between mass and velocity. Um, but what I've done is I've basically color coded. So at the lowest speeds, we had no optical and no plasma. And then in the blue, we had um, optical detection. In the orange was plasma detection. Purple was both optical and plasma. Um, but then I want to draw your attention to the green circles. This is when we detected RF. And the first thing we noticed was that there seems to be some kind of cutoff where radio frequency emission is not being generated or we're not detecting it for the lowest velocities. And if you plot this in terms of accumulated distribution, you could look at your RF detection rate as a function of impact speed. There is this, again, almost a cutoff at about 18, 20 kilometers per second where you're far more likely to detect RF emission or generate RF emission at the higher velocities. And um, what we found, basically, is that this is consistent with where you have this transition from a partial ionization to a fully ionized plasma. So there's a physical reason for it as well. OK, so in summary, then, what does this mean? So we did ground-based experiments. We detected radio frequency emission. But then as we went to the spacecraft community, the first question we always got asked was, is this going to be a problem for a satellite? And my answer right now is a guarded yes. And so what I'm plotting here, what I'm showing in this table, is the electric field generated from these particles, peak power, total kinetic energy, and then the energy. And so they're ground-based tests. Again, remember, we're shooting femtogram-sized particles at about 40 kilometers per second. If we scale this to things that we'd have to worry about, let's say a nanogram, which again impacts a, spare, a square meter spacecraft once per day, you're going from an electric field of about 10 to the minus 3 volts per meter all the way up to 10 to the fifth volts per meter. 
Same thing with peak power, obviously, orders of magnitude scaling up. So there's a big question, can we do this? Will, will this uh, relationship hold as we go to higher and higher masses? And we still can't answer that, but what I can tell you is that spacecraft, depending on which spacecraft, are currently spec to about 10 volts per meter. So we are orders of magnitude higher than what spacecraft are currently spec to. Keep in mind that these plasmas are very tiny, so the imprint or the footprint on the spacecraft will be quite small. It'll be there and gone very quickly on the order of microseconds. But if you happen to hit next to a sensitive component, um, absolutely this could possibly get into your spacecraft and cause damage. And again, remember this is electromagnetic. We're not talking about electrostatic fields, we're talking about electromagnetic. Okay, so in conclusion, again, um, I know this is a bit of a different topic, um, but what we're looking at is I think the first time trying to understand how really tiny particles can potentially cause electrical damage on spacecraft. And so I would say it's still poorly understood. We've certainly published a few papers. There's a couple other groups that are pursuing this, a well, this as well. We've taken a two-pronged approach where we're using big radars to detect the plasma formed when these particles come into our atmosphere in order to see what's out there, how big are they. Um, but then the majority of our efforts have been um, focused on simulations, which I didn't get a chance to show you, as well as ground-based experiments. Uh, we have a bunch of different sensors, and again, I borrowed this idea from Los Alamos where we had a bunch of different types of sensors on board the GPS constellation to look for ground-based EMP. Very similar concept that I'm putting now um, in the chamber in order to determine whether these EMPs are being generated. There's definitely a strong dependence on speed and biasing conditions, um, but I can say absolutely we're detecting radio frequency emission associated with these particles. Um, but I'll say that the implications for spacecraft failure are still largely unknown. I believe it is a threat, but again, this is something that needs more work. Okay, thank you. We have time for a few questions. Hi, Sigrid, this is wonderful, thank you. Um, so on your slide number nine, uh, you have a big radar uh, looking into the plasma. Mm -hmm. um, so because uh, I'm a positioning person, so how can you locate where to look at? You can't, you just stare and you hope that they come through. So these are going oh. way too fast. So what we're doing is we're just staring at the radiant, the point from where these particles seem to emanate from. I see. Um, luckily enough, there's about 100 billion particles that come in every day. So we detect them about once a second. So it's more like we don't, when you're trying to track satellites, you want to get above that altitude because you're just going to get swamped. It's going to look like noise and clutter in your signal. I see. And yep. then you also mentioned that uh, the plasma actually also moves quite fast, yes. right? And does it mean like you have to uh, move your big radar uh, fast as well? Because for my PhD work, I used the, the big dish over the Stanford Hill. Yeah. I know it didn't <laughs> move very fast. It doesn't slew that quickly. No. no, again, we just stared. And so we let these particles come through. So most of them are coming straight down the beam. So we detect them maybe for one or two seconds. And that's how we would get out the velocity. So we're just looking at the range rate and then using the monopulse to correct that for 3D velocity. But you're right, no, you can't track them quick <laughs> enough. You just let them fly through. And luckily, there's so many of them that, um, again, we get one a second. It's, it's a huge amount of data to try to get through. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. <clears throat> yes, I had two questions. I, I, you might have mentioned it at the space station. Very large, high power. Yes. Uh, are there any algorithms or, or data mining that's going on from all that telemetry data that's in sensors that is brought down that allow researchers across the globe to analyze that? And the second part question, the long duration, long duration exposure facility that was unfortunately stranded up you know, due to the Challenger accident, was on orbit a few extra years, which is actually hardware we got back. Has there been any forensics on the onboard hardware there that any lessons learned from that as well? Yes, so great questions. I think what the community is starting to do is realize that there is a lot of data, there are a lot of data out there that we could potentially use to look for these signals. And so what we're finding, and it's, it's kind of pervasive right now, depends on which instrument you're looking at, is that they are seeing these anomalies, these RF blips, which people had previously discounted. And now what they're trying to do is correlate those RF blips with other sensors on the spacecraft that are looking at the health of the spacecraft. So I would say just in the past couple of years, people are starting to mine all the data. Um, we've tried to fly solo missions, CubeSats, and other things, and fortunately that hasn't happened yet. But um, yes, there's quite a bit of data that are just now starting to, to be looked at, I'd say. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, right here. Yep. <laughs> uh, two questions, if time permits me. One is, um, are there any thoughts or ideas about threat mitigation? I'm sorry, uh, I missed the last part. Uh, are there any ideas or thoughts about threat mitigation? Uh, yes. And the second one uh, is, are there any discernible effects on, say, the attitude kinematics of the spacecraft that could be exploited using anomalies in the control system? That could use that could be used to detect things like these. Yeah, great questions. Um, so, in terms of threat mitigation, I've started to think about this. One of the ideas, because it's electromagnetic and it seems to be very broad in frequency, it's going to be um, more of a placement. So, you, you can't just wrap your wires. You're, you're going to get too heavy to to fly into space. So, but if you can strategically position your sensors inside the spacecraft. Um, in such a way as to maybe not be as close to the surface, one of the things we're looking at, that would potentially be one way to mitigate it. Why the gyro is susceptible, we're not sure. But the gyro's failed at least twice. There's a third event, which I can't discuss here. So this is one of the things that we need to look at. And if we could actually get some of that anomaly data on the gyro, that might help us then inform how to actually mitigate future threats. Um, in terms of your second question, yeah, I think that we're starting to look at some of these data. But again, this is still such a new field that we haven't really made any progress. Uh, f first a statement and then a question. Yeah. You can add to your list a transit satellite in the early 70s. The particle hit the gravity gradient boom, flipped it over 180 degrees, and it took them over two months to get it reinverted. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, the, the question is, uh, you did your tests on tungsten because that was the, the, the highest. Dense. Yep. How much is reduced by the other materials that are typically on a spacecraft? There's not a whole lot of tungsten. There's not a lot of tungsten, yes. Um, so you caught that. Um, yes, we did tungsten, aluminum, a bunch of different spacecraft material. We'll still see plasma. I would say the strongest signals, and it's not an order of magnitude in strength when we're detecting net current, um, maybe half an order of magnitude, so for these femtogram-sized particles. But we still see very strong signals on optical solar reflectors, the solar cells. All of them will give us plasma and RF. The strongest RF emission was tungsten biased negatively at the high-velocity particles. So that suite of uh, different parameters would allow us to see the RF very easily. Um, what Andrew showed a couple days ago, some of the RF he detected was not on tungsten, but then you have to do more signal processing and massaging of the data. Not a huge effect, but definitely, yes, tungsten's dense. It gives you the best, best plasma. So I would like to publicly um, uh, congratulate you on receiving tenure in yeah. the Aero Astro Department. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you.